Hello and welcome from First United Methodist Church in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, except I mean, it's more on behalf of the church because I am at Grove United Methodist Church outside Westchester. And I want to share a little bit, well, not I, but get somebody else to talk a little bit about how we are the church beyond our walls and how we can be the church and have been the church inside some very different walls. And that has to do with a Christmas card project organized by the prison ministry of the Eastern Pennsylvania Annual Conference. One of the people who helped organize that and got us to help out too uh, is Deacon Marilyn Schneider. And she has kindly consented to fill us in on another step in the project that we were part of the early part of. I really start, should start scripting this a little better, shouldn't I? Anyway, um, I'll hand you over to her. Just a moment. So I just wanted to share with you how great a success our Christmas Cards for People in Prison project was this year. All total, we collected 6,960 cards with encouraging messages written on them to be distributed amongst 12 different facilities, as well as for the Philadelphia prison system, we collected 3,187 blank cards, unwritten on cards that the chaplain there could distribute to people so that they could send Christmas greetings to their family and friends. The, this, is, this project is so important and we are so grateful that so many people were willing to participate and complete these cards and, and donate them. Because we hear from chaplains now how important an impact this makes on people who are in prison. At one facility, the chaplain told me that people were asking him around Thanksgiving if this was going to happen this year because they remembered it from last year and were so looking forward to getting another card. At other facilities, chaplains tell me how important it is for people to receive these cards because some people do not get any cards from anybody or no mail whatsoever. So it is incredibly meaningful when they uh, receive a card from someone on the outside expressing their care and love for them. So I just wanted to thank you all for being willing to be a part of this project and to sharing God's love with these folks who really need to hear about it, particularly at Christmas. So thank you. And so there you have it. And if you're in Phoenixville, sit tight because I think we may also have a Valentine's project on our hands. Uh, more about that either later in the service, if it fits, or next week. Same channel. But for now, let's go before the Lord in worship. This week we hear from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, beginning of verse 18 and running down to verse 31. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning. I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation, to save those who believe. 
For Jews demand signs, and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. I want to welcome you all this morning to First United Methodist Church, Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. Surprised? I am. I didn't think I could pull that accent off, and maybe I didn't. But what do you think when you hear that? You know, we are trained in a lot of ways by the places we grow up, by the people that are around us, by the TV shows we watch, by the movies, to make assumptions that are not well-founded about people based on a lot of things. And when you're watching a movie and a character comes in speaking that way, what do you think about that character? Or what do you think somebody wants you to think about that character? Uh-huh. And the same thing happens. The Eagles are going to the playoffs this afternoon, and there are going to be Eagles fans that are going to be interviewed. And there are folks down in Decatur, Georgia, and Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and they're going to hear somebody say, yeah, go Eagles, it goes all the way, yeah, fly, Eagles, fly. And they're going to make assumptions about that person. Snobbery is what we call it. We never get over it in a lot of ways. And it takes a lot of forms. It's not just about the way people speak. It may be about the way they look. It may be about money. It might be around family connections or where they live. It could be about the work that they do. The list goes on and on. And once you start writing it down, you won't stop. But what snobbery does, and it is snobbery, is it cuts somebody off from someone else because they're are certain assumptions and expectations that we may have of somebody that either we place on them unduly or that they just don't meet because they've never seen our list. 
snobbery. It can keep us from getting to know some absolutely wonderful people and having some really terrific friendships. And if we start applying the same kind of dynamics that we put on one another to God, it cuts us off from the source of our life. And I don't want that to happen. See, there is a kind of snobbery that human beings display toward God. There are times when God does not meet our human expectations. And that means for some people that they might as well just move on and not pay any attention to him. God does not do the God thing, does not provide what we want on demand just because we use the right words or say the right things or pray the right way. That overlooks the fact, of course, that God does provide what we need and provide what is best. But that's a whole different matter for a different discussion. Right now, I just want to point out that a lot of people write God off because they don't see God always doing what they think God ought to be doing. People get hurt who don't deserve it. And when that happens, we don't see a lightning bolt zap the wrongdoer. And why doesn't God step in whenever there's a disaster or some kind of major injustice? That's a big question. And there are all sorts of philosophical answers to questions like that, however you want to formulate it. And some of the philosophical answers, quite honestly, make some sense to me, at least when I hear them. But it isn't just about hearing an answer. It's about experiencing an answer, where that give and take has to come in. And sometimes, sometimes, people are not willing to engage in that. And again, if someone demands an answer, even if you get an answer, it may not be what you really are looking for. Not that I'm telling you what you're looking for. You judge it for yourself. But here's an example. If I am in the middle of a crisis, or say I'm the victim of a rare medical disorder of some sort, there will be very, very little actual human comfort for my heart if even someone I care about deeply comes to me and says, I am so sorry. I am so sorry that you are going through this illness. But look, it's genetic. And, and since genes have to randomly mutate in order for those variations to pop up throughout the human species that allow us to, to adapt and to go on over the, the millennia and the, and the millions of years that it takes, to, those things are just going to happen to give us a greater chance of survival as a whole. You may be out of luck, but it's because the rest of us get a better chance because of it. If it helps, think of yourself as the unfortunate 
exception that clears the way for everyone else. Gee, thanks, that helps. Sometimes we want God to fix things. Sometimes we just want to know why. And neither of those is sufficient. Paul put it this way. He said, Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom. Two great things that human beings look to. Signs and wisdom. And neither is enough. Not only doesn't God just fix things, we may find ourselves hit with a sense of purposelessness, and that can be downright brutal. Now, I'm not sure how to approach that human condition of ours, except to stick to the news that the God I know doesn't act totally above and beyond us. Although, in a philosophical way, again, he is. But he's not always acting according to wisdom, according to our wisdom. God has his own wisdom and his own ways. Despite what I tell God, he should be, who God should be. It's not up to me. And God doesn't have to prove anything to anybody. And that, that in an incredible way, turns out to leave him free. Free from my snobbery. Free in his own way, not to live up to my expectations, and therefore free to act in a way that he chooses, and that in the long run sets us free too. Because God chooses, and here's, here's where Christianity has an answer to these things. God chooses to get mixed up in exactly the dark side of things, the confusing side of things, the unknown side of things, the inexplicable side of things that we human beings cannot handle. God, in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, showed us what a totally and spotlessly pure life would look like. And even that was not enough to shield him from any of the things we face. In fact, it was this Jesus of Nazareth, whose lack of sin brought him into conflict with and made him a target of all the systems of, of power and control that we set up to deal with the inexplicability, the uncontrollability of human life. From the day that he was born, Herod was threatened by Jesus' mere existence. And another Herod would feel the same way and would drag the Romans into it, which, frankly, didn't take much work. And together, they would get rid of him. They would nail him to a cross outside Jerusalem and leave him there to die, leaving God's own self as a victim of injustice, leaving God's own self 
as a crime victim, leaving God's own self as one that was torn up, literally, by all the give and take. Somebody who was there because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time, as they saw it, but as God saw it, just the right place and just the right time. Because it would be in the inexplicability and the unknownness of human life that God would enter and change life itself. So that that death in the middle of all the bad stuff, the center of human sin, that itself would become not a roadblock, a stumbling block, an obstacle. It would become a way, a truth, life. Jesus' death would lead to his rising again, and death and life would both be changed. What would die and would stay dead would be the despair and the hopelessness that comes through human pride. The crucifixion of that man was the opening of a door into every hopeless human situation and a door through which God steps and says, I'm here. I'm here for you. And so if God could be betrayed as he was in Jesus, then he can be there whenever somebody is stabbed in the back by somebody they love. If God can have a crown of thorns jammed onto his head, he can be there for the one whose pains are treated as a joke by the people who inflict them. If God can be there on a cross, God can can be there in a concentration camp. If God can gasp for thirst, he's there too when someone dies of dehydration or hunger in the middle of a famine. This, this presence of God, not signs of power, not theories about the universe. This weakness of God. Not human strength, not human wisdom. This foolishness of God. That's what we have to share. It's a message about God's weakness and God's humility and God's love which are utterly connected and flip everything else upside down and turn everything else inside out. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning, I will thwart. There's a passage written by James Allen Francis in 1926 that's on this picture in our church library. The language in it is clearly a hundred years old, but it really puts the point well. He was born in an obscure village. He worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. He then became an itinerant preacher he never held an office, he 
He never had a family or owned a house. He didn't go to college. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 when the public turned against him. His friends ran away. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property he had on earth. He was laid in a borrowed grave. Nineteen centuries have come and gone, and today he is the central figure of the human race. All the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, and all the kings that ever reigned have not affected the life of man on earth as much as that one solitary life. So consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful, not many of noble worth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what's weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what's low, even despised in the world. Things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He's the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Your ways are not our own, O gracious God Most High. Yet we would follow in your paths and on your love rely. How shall we show your love, your pardon to believe? us share as we are blessed and give as we receive. Forgiveness is our joy, receiving, giving to. Keep us from judgment hard and cruel that we may dwell with you. Send us forth, O Lord, with your love. Send us forth to share your love. Send us forth, we ask, with your blessing of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.